now um, our final uh, presentation for our uh, traditional Christmas meeting is the traditional Christmas sky notes from uh, our traditional, traditional comment Nick section James. director uh, Nick James and uh, so Nick's going to tell us about a few of the things that we can see over the coming, coming weeks and uh, uh, in the run-up to Christmas and uh, maybe there might be a comet picture or two. There might be a few. There might be a few. Hopefully there'll be something apart from comet pictures. But um. uh, <laughs> Over to Nick. Thank you, Callum. Um, yeah, so it is traditional in these sky notes that this is not pushing the creme brulee analogy too far, that this is the kind of soft, mushy bit at the end of the hard talks. And so uh, it gives me the opportunity to talk about what's coming up over the next month or two, but also to showcase some of the fantastic images that uh, people in the BAA send in. And uh, I really like this one. It's quite old, actually. This is from 2013, but it's a picture by Ronan Newman of the, uh, of the noctilucent cloud. Um, really nice, pretty picture. Um, anyway, what I'll do is I'll start in the middle of the solar system with this featureless yellow disk, which is the sun. Um, a few weeks ago, I gave a, a talk to Newbury Society on comets, and I said uh, something along the lines of, nobody will ever discover a comet visually again. <laughs> um, so will there ever be sunspots again? I don't know, but at the moment, the sun is incredibly inactive. Um, never say never, but at the moment, uh, there's very little activity on the sun, even for those people who've got H-alpha setups. Uh, this is a SOHO MDI image from um, this morning, I think, um, basically showing pretty much nothing. But the, the effects of the sun, of course, we still have. And this is a lovely picture of the aurora by Gordon Mackey. Um, he lives up in Caithness, uh, sends me some fantastic pictures from the north of Scotland. Uh, and I think this, this panorama particularly just captures the majesty of the aurora. Um, there's another auroral, auroral feature that um, we'll have heard quite a lot about uh, this year. It's this thing called Steve. Um, now, Dennis Brzezinski saw this from up in Scotland, and he, he sent it around saying it looks really a bit like a kind of sun-grazing comet. But it's this bright column of light, and it's a perfect example of how um, scientists have kind of done what's called a backronym uh, for the name. So Steve was actually a name given to this phenomenon originally by the amateur astronomers who saw it. Um, and it comes from some animated series about a character that, or something about where, when people walk through uh, a forest and they saw something they didn't understand, they called it Steve, just Steve. But of course, once geophysicists get on that, they can't possibly live with the fact it's just called Steve after a cartoon character. So they did this thing called a backronym. Presumably they all sat in a room for hours to try and think what acronym they could get for Steve. So, Apparently, it's sudden thermal emission velocity enhancement. <laughs> so they say. Um, another lovely picture from Gordon. Just, uh, it seems quite a while ago now, but we had a fantastic summer, didn't we? And this is a picture from uh, a particularly lovely part of the British Isles. This is Dunnet Head. This is the most northerly part of Great Britain, looking over to Orkney. Just an absolutely gorgeous picture and a, a reminder of that lovely summer that we had, uh, which kind of seems to have disappeared into long off memory now, unfortunately. Okay, so just starting going through the night sky, when it sort of shortly after it gets dark, uh, the most prominent planet we have in the night sky is Mars. Very easy to find, it's in Aquarius, it's actually uh, rather higher now than it was when it was at its very closest to us, when it was uh, at opposition but it shrunk down from the, the huge diameter it had then to something under 10 arc seconds or so now. But uh, planetary images are still getting remarkably good images of this planet, uh, despite its very small um, diameter. You can still see the polar cap there and various other features on the surface. And visual observers too, so Paul Abel's been sending in drawings of Mars. You can see now that it's a long way after opposition, you can actually see the phase. So quite often people think that it's only the inner planets, Venus and Mercury, which actually show a phase, and that's because they show the whole range of phases from crescent through half to the gibbous to full. But even the outer planets show phases, but, you, but not to the same extent. So Mars is showing a fairly significant gibbous phase at the moment. 
Uh, that can be seen on Jupiter too, but once you get further out, the geometry is such that we very rarely see them anything other than full. Um, now, another planet that's very, very close to Mars at the moment, which makes it easy to find if you've never seen it um, before, is Neptune. So this is a, a really nice image by Martin Lewis of, of Neptune. How many people in the room here have actually seen Neptune? Yeah, all right. And the reason you all saw it last night, if you did, is that it's really, really close to Mars. So last night, uh, Neptune was, was right next to Mars. Um, here's a picture of it from last night. How about that? So that's, that's Mars here, Neptune there. And actually, if you blow up the picture of Neptune, you can even see Triton there. So this is a, um, a three by two field of view. I had my, uh, my camera out ready to photograph a much more important object, which is Comet Vertinen, uh, and I thought, why not have a look at Mars whilst I had the chance. Um, tonight, uh, Neptune's quite a bit further away from Mars, but still a got good opportunity to find it. And over the next few days, for those of you who haven't taken the opportunity, I think the forecast for tomorrow evening is, is it's likely to be clear. So if you haven't seen Neptune, get out, telescope, pair of binoculars, look at Mars, look a little bit to the right of Mars for a kind of bluish ninth magnitude, eighth ninth magnitude planet, um, and you should be able to find it. So that's, uh, that's one of the fainter planets. So we've had Mars and Neptune. Um, if we look over into the western sky as the sun's going down, as the sky darkens, we've got the constellations of summer in the sky, Cygnus and Lyra and Aquila, and there are quite a few interesting objects in Cygnus to the variable star observers amongst us. So, whoops, Chi Cygni is, is a, an object that is um, an example of a Myra star. So Chi Cygni is, is a long period variable. It varies in brightness slowly. It's currently about its maximum brightness. And if you look at Cygnus with a pair of binoculars, uh, basically down here, there, there's a star that comes and goes over the months, and that's Chi Cygni. Um, it'll be a binocular object probably until February, so it's a good chance to see it. Gary sent me this light curve here, which shows that it really is a variable star. It goes up and down and up and down and up and down and <laughs> up and down and up and down and up and down. And Gary gets really excited about that kind of stuff. Because every now and again, it goes up and down in a different way to the way that it went up and down before. Uh, this is another variable star, but actually this is a kind of slightly more interesting than straight up and down. This is our Corona Borealis star. Um, it's in uh, Sagittarius, uh, which is actually quite a difficult thing to get to at the moment if you go back and have a look. So Sagittarius is kind of here right at the bottom of Cygnus. It's disappearing into the western twilight at the moment. But SV Sagittar is going through an interesting phase. So this is a variable star that's been, sort of sits at a particular magnitude and has then faded down quite rapidly. And this is the deepest fade since the 1960s. Um, and I think you'll agree, this is a much more interesting light curve than Chi Sig. Um, and right at the very end here, you can see this thing falling off a cliff here. This is the recent phase. Uh, the fade of this star, and here it is magnified up. So it's gone from about 11th magnitude to 17th magnitude. So this isn't a binocular object, this is a telescope, telescopic object. But it's just Sod's law that basically this really interesting event has happened just as it's heading towards solar conjunction. So any observations you can get, if you're a keen variable star observer of this star over the next, uh, next few weeks before it finally kind of uh, becomes impossible to observe, would definitely be appreciated by the variable star section. Um, so looking around due south, we've got the big constellation of Cetus the Whale. And there are two things in this vicinity that are particularly interesting. The planet Uranus up here, which is actually just in Pisces. And uh, here's a, a nice image of that by Damien Peach. So Damien now, uh, rather than imaging using kind of small Celestron 14E type telescopes um, and traveling around the world to do it, he uses a one meter telescope in Chile, uh, which I think is one of the very few telescopes that you can do remote planetary observing. So effectively, this is taking high frame rate video of planets um, 
uh, remotely, which is something that up until recently has been really difficult to do. But uh, Damien's getting some absolutely fantastic results. And, and just to actually get this kind of detail on a planet that's only, what's the diameter of Uranus? About one and a bit arc seconds, something like that. Four, is it? Okay, so it's Neptune now. About four arc seconds across. Well, it's easy then. <laughs> <coughs> In fact, it was really interesting to see that ALMA plot. I don't know whether you looked at the scale on that plot of the disks in ALMA. That was one arc second, and it was about that size was one arc second. So an incredible resolution there. But I think we'll all agree that the most interesting thing that's in that part of the sky at the moment is this object. Boo! Um, the BAA has recently been receiving lots of images of large green fuzzy blobs. Uh, this is Comet Verton and 46P. I'll talk a little bit more about that, as you might imagine, towards the end of this. Uh, and hopefully, uh, people will go out and try and observe it. It's not easy to see. I'll tell you it's not easy to see. I just about managed to get it in, a, in binoculars last night from where I live, which is quite a light polluted site. But I've seen things in the media where it's talked about this comet as being as big as the moon, which in terms of angular size it is. It's actually something like a degree across at the moment. But if you imagine that the moon is half a degree across and maybe when it's full it's magnitude minus 12, this thing is a degree across, and it's magnitude plus 5. So all of its light is spread across this very, very fuzzy blob. So whilst it's actually quite easy to get a photograph or an image of this, it's really, really hard to see it in binoculars. If you're in a dark site, a really nice dark sky, then you can. But for most of us who live in light-polluted sites, this is a really difficult object to pick up. And that's why I think it's a shame kind of the media portray these things as bright comets that people can go out and see. They're, they're anything but visually. Anyway, a little bit more about that later, but before we do that, yet another variable star. Gary, you're favored. <laughs> favored. So this is the, this is the prototype uh, Myra star. This is Omicron Ceti. So this is the star right here in the whale, Omicron Ceti there. And again, another of these light curves that goes up and down and up and down and up and down. But the interesting thing about this star, of course, is that the up and down goes to quite bright magnitudes. And so Myra at the moment is somewhere about third magnitude, so easy to pick up uh, and estimate in a pair of binoculars. So if you don't observe any other variable star over the Christmas period, at least go out and pick up Myra. Uh, it's, a, it's a star that uh, won't be back to this magnitude. What's its period, Myra? 600? It's about a year. About a year. Right. Oh, well, next Christmas I'll mention it again then. <laughs> so looking over to, uh, to the east as, uh, as the, the, the sort of night wears on, we get the familiar winter stars coming up, Orion. And there's been some interesting stuff in, in Orion recently. Now, I always used to be slightly disparaging of deep sky observers. They would, they would go out and they would take images of objects, and they're absolutely fantastic. I mean, the quality of images that deep sky observers get, absolutely fantastic but it's the same object. And basically all that's changing is they've got a new camera, they've got a new lens, they've got new software, they, they, you know, things progress, and that's why things, things do progress. But most of the time, I think even most deep sky observers would say deep sky things are pretty much constant. With the exception of a few things, which are the variable nebulae. And this particular one, McNeil's variable nebula, which is in not far from M98, so, uh, sorry, M78, uh, not far here from the belt of Orion. Mike Harlow took an image of this recently that showed it had actually disappeared. So this is where I get confused on the big screen. Is it that? Yes. Yeah, okay. So yes, if you look just to the right of those two stars, uh, gosh. Yes, look to the right of the two stars. You see McNeil's nebula there. And it's gone. Um, so this is, this is quite a big thing, and one of those things where, where deep sky observers can actually take images of objects that vary. So what's going on here is that there is a variable star. We come back to variable stars again, because they're the root of all these things. A variable star that's basically illuminating this nebula, and there's dust in that nebula. And, and what must have happened is that the dust is currently obscuring the light from the star so that the nebula has faded away. But it'll be interesting to see when it comes back. 
So keep an eye on this particular area of the sky and this particular nebula. As we go around to the morning sky, we've got Venus. Those of you who are kind of up around 6, 7 o'clock in the morning will have seen Venus in the morning sky. And a few days ago, we had a lovely conjunction of Venus and the moon. I think this was the 3rd or 4th, 4th of December. Um, I saw Venus this morning when I got up. Uh, it's, it's a very bright object, very difficult to miss at the moment. It's gradually moving out to its furthest uh, west of the sun, and its phase is gradually increasing. So this picture at the moment, this one is actually on the BAA main front page. It's an absolutely astonishingly clear picture of Venus uh, at a very, very thin crescent phase uh, by uh, Martin Lewis here. Um, and then Chris, Chris Dahl took this one. Uh, as, as Venus has been moving out from the sun, its diameter shrinks and the phase has been getting larger. And then uh, it reaches its maximum distance to the west of the sun in the morning sky, um, somewhere at the beginning of January, I think, isn't it? It's uh, January the 6th. But before then, um, next week, in fact, Mercury uh, reaches its greatest western elongation uh, for the final elongation of this year. Uh, that's on the 15th of December. So those of you with a good southeastern horizon uh, who are up at the right time in the morning, go out and see if you can pick up Mercury. It's much, much more difficult to pick up Mercury than Venus. It's a much fainter object, and it's always much closer to the sun, so in a much brighter sky. And what's amazing is that amateurs actually managed to get images now of Mercury showing detail. Um, so these are some images by Chris Hooker. And what he's done is he's actually combined, he's comparing what he's seeing in his imaging uh, with uh, a reference image from the Messenger spacecraft. And doing that, you can actually see there's quite a lot of correlation between the images uh, that he's getting through his telescope and what the Messenger spacecraft uh, is predicting would be there. And again, just an incredible demonstration of what amateurs are able to do now in terms of imaging planets, really small planets under very, very difficult circumstances. And that's all down to increasing skill from the observers, but also the amazing technology of cameras now that can take very, very high frame rates um, uh, and the software that can then process this and stack the images. For those of us who can't aspire to this kind of imaging, one of the things that's fairly Easy to observe, of course, is the International Space Station, and we're just going through now a set of evening passes of the ISS. In fact, there, there, I think there was one just now. This is for tomorrow. This is the equivalent pass for tomorrow, going across the, the sky about uh, 20 past 5 in the evening. Um, so over the next few nights, you can look out for the ISS. There's a really good website, if you're interested, called calsky.com, which allows you to predict, get predictions for when the ISS will transit across objects like the moon or the sun. And so this image by Steve Knight here is an image he took with a DSLR camera running in video mode, uh, where basically he, he's detected the ISS crossing over the, the sun. And this is quite a fun thing to do. Typically in astronomy, it's also quite a frustrating thing to do because you might need to drive a few miles to find an appropriate place to set up, uh, and then the weather will, will prevent you from seeing it. But to actually get something like this, this thing whizzes across the sun in, in something like a second or under a second or so, and the idea is to have a high, a high frame rate, uh, which you can get from a digital camera, uh, but short exposures so that you freeze the motion of the ISS. You can just, if you blow this up, see some detail here. And depending on how far away the ISS is when it transits the sun, you can actually see quite a lot of detail. But the real kind of peak of imaging these things um, is, is this, this guy. Uh, so Ralph Vandenberg in the Netherlands uh, gets images like this. And you think, what kind of incredibly advanced system does he have for this? He actually has a camera on a telescope which he pushes around by hand, tracking the ISS as it crosses the sky. And if you're lucky, every now and again, you'll get a period when you're tracking accurately enough with a short enough exposure that you can actually extract uh, images. And the, these images are just incredible. 
I mean, uh, amazing things. But if you want a fun project, have a go at doing that. Stick a camera on a telescope, wait for the ISS to come across, follow it in the finder, leave the camera running in video mode and see what you get. You won't get anything like this, but you may be surprised that you actually can see some structure on the ISS. It's quite a large object. It's something like 60 arc seconds across when it's close. So if you can track it, or if you can do short enough exposures, you can actually get quite a lot of detail. So that's pretty impressive stuff. Uh, again, something we can all see uh, coming up in January, although it does involve getting up early in the morning, is that there's a, a total eclipse of the moon on the morning of January the 21st. It's basically at its maximum around 5 o'clock in the morning, which tells you that it's going to be fairly low in the west when it happens, which is true. It's going to be over here. So basically, it's about, from, from where I am, uh, at, uh, at maximum eclipse, it's about 20 degrees up in the uh, western sky. So you need a, a, a fairly good western horizon to follow that one down. Um, there's also a partial eclipse of the sun coming up. Who's going to see this partial eclipse? Nobody. It amazes me that people do actually go travel quite long distances these days just because they can, I guess, to see partial eclipses. But this one is a real pain to get to. <laughs> um, <coughs> this one's up here. Uh, so about as far away and as, as inconvenient as you can possibly hope to get, well, apart from being in Antarctica, I suppose. Um, and it is a partial eclipse, and it's only about 70% uh, partial, and then only if you happen to be in this far eastern bit of uh, Siberia, and the sun is on the horizon, and at this time in the year, it being January, there aren't clouds on the horizon preventing you from seeing it. So the likelihood that we're going to get much, uh, much of this is, uh, from there is, is pretty small, I would think. Probably most of the observations we're going to get are from around Japan and that kind of area of a smaller partial eclipse. So leaving the solar system and the planets, moving a bit further out into the universe, um, this is M31, the, Ast the Andromeda Galaxy, and uh, a UK amateur, George Carey, has a program of surveying the Andromeda Galaxy looking for variable objects, mainly novae. He does it pretty much on every clear night. There's a lot of competition now. There are a lot of uh, people looking for novae, uh, but he discovered this one, 2018 JAS, um, in... Uh, Andromeda, it's about 17th magnitude, and Robin Ledbetter managed to get a spectrum of it. That's pretty impressive for an amateur get, to get a spectrum of a 17th magnitude object, showing all these kind of interesting novary type lines that spectroscopists like. Uh, he did say it was a fairly low signal to noise ratio, but it is at 17th magnitude. Um, coming back in, these little dust particles hitting our atmosphere from asteroid 3200 Python are the Geminids. And this year, the Geminid meteor shower is going to be hopefully a really good one. The, the moon is pretty much out of the sky after midnight when the shower is at its best. Um, and if the weather works out, then we should have a pretty good display of meteors on towards the end of the week, sort of 12th, 13th, 13th, 14th of December. I'm already getting Geminids on my, oops, on my um, video camera. Here's a, here's a couple um, I got last night within a, a few minutes of each other. So the Geminids have, have started up um, and are quite active already, so it's, it's uh, worth getting out to observe them. But the main thing will be around um, the end of next week uh, when they'll be at their, their maximum. Uh, there's one other meteor shower coming up before the next uh, BAA sky notes, and that's the Quadrantids in early January, January the 3rd. That, again, is going to be a good meteor shower. It's a very short shower, so you really need to be out um, on the morning of January the 3rd. Uh, it's going to be a nice dark morning because there's no moon. It'll be perfect weather conditions, but uh, just make sure that you wrap up warm because it is January. Uh, but the Quadrantids is another interesting shower to look at. In terms of what's happening in space at the moment, uh, this is uh, the asteroid uh, Bennu, uh, which uh, has been arrived at, uh, the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft has arrived here. Um, 
This thing on the bottom here is not the sort of orbital shells of electrons around some um, interesting atomic particle. It's actually the orbits of the spacecraft as it's doing a mapping of this object uh, because the intention is to land a lander on this object and actually bring back a sample from the surface. Um, it's an interesting object because this is a potential Earth impactor. Um, it's a fairly low probability and it's not going to worry us too much because it's 2175 to 2196. Uh, but there's a 0.04% chance at the moment that this object uh, could impact the Earth, and it's quite large. It's about 500 metres across, so it would do quite a lot of damage. So, comets. I'm going to have to bore you with some stuff on comets. I did, I did say that I'd, I'd spoken to Newbury recently, and I said to them, it's very unlikely anyone will discover a comet visually again. And one week later, somebody did. And the reason it's unlikely that people will discover comets visually now is that mostly they're swept up by things like this. This is the PanStars telescope on Hawaii. They tend to find comets when they're very faint, um, far fainter than we can discover them, even if we're using uh, electronic cameras, and certainly far fainter than visual observers can discover comets. So the only way that visual, a visual observer is actually going to be able to discover a comet is if somehow the comet sneaks in behind the sun in such a way that it's too faint for the, vision, for the surveys to find when it's near opposition. And then it brightens up rapidly as it gets close to the sun. And that's what happened in this case. This is Comet C2018V1. This has got a real proper cometary name. When I started Comet uh, observing back in the 80s, comets had proper names. They were called things like Comet Nishikawa Takamazawa Tego or something like that. Mostly these days, though, comets are called pan-stars or linear or whatever. Now, this has got a proper name. This is comet Makholtz Fujikawa Iwamoto. So Makholtz, Don Makholtz, uh, was the one who discovered it visually. Uh, Mr. Fujikawa here and Iwamoto discovered it using small cameras on small telescopes from Japan. But they all discovered it on the same morning, um, just as it was coming out of the solar glare in Virgo here. And this was an example, and I, I've got a little plot here to show you why it was that they managed to discover this. So this comet, this blue curve here, is showing you how bright we think the comet was. The purple curve shows you how far away from the sun it was, its elongation. And the green curve shows you what its declination was. And this comet was one of those comets that was very close to the sun, whenever it was reasonably bright. And at the point where the surveys look, which is over when it's far away from the sun, it was way too faint to be seen. So this was a very unusual event, but it did happen. So this is the first visual discovery since 2010, um, and I suspect they'll get rarer and rarer still. So eventually, one day, I will give a sky notes, and it will be probably the last visual discovery, but it won't be maybe for a while. Um, and this is the, the survey coverage when the comet was actually available to the surveys, but at this point it was far too faint to be picked up. It's a comet that's got a, a dreadful magnitude scatter. So visual, you know, variable star observers like to estimate even visual ones to kind of a tenth of magnitude. Look at the scatter here. It's going from mag 7.5 to about 9.5. But that's because this was a fuzzy object in a fairly bright sky. It had a nice tail. Um, very briefly, just after it was discovered. And this is some images by Michael Yeager showing it was actually quite a nice comet. But it's dived down in towards its perihelion. Its perihelion was December the 3rd. It still exists. This is it here. We thought it might not survive perihelion, but it has done. And so it's a visual comet discovery which, which sort of is very much like the old days of cometary observing. You just, a comet was discovered and we had an opportunity to observe it for a few weeks before essentially it's, it's disappeared. These days, most comets we actually get discovered when they're at magnitude 18, 19, 20. So we have months to, or years to observe them before they actually disappear back out into the outer solar system. And as an example of that, this is the comet that's making the news at the moment. This is Comet Vertinen 46P. It's a periodic comet. And hopefully, um, you should all get a chance to actually uh, see it. But you will need to get to a dark site. It's going to be about 
fifth magnitude or even fourth magnitude passing the Pleiades in Taurus um, on the, the night of December the 16th. So it's perfectly placed for us. You will need to get somewhere dark. But if you just try and take some pictures, even with a compact camera on a tripod, you'll probably pick up something. You'll probably pick up a sort of faint green fuzzy blob. It's currently coming up through Cetus, um, and over the next few weeks, uh, it'll be perfectly placed for us if we get good weather. So this is where it's going. Currently due, due south, about 10 p.m. It's at its highest. It's going to head up through Taurus here over the next few weeks. In theory, it should get to about mag four and a half or so, but don't be fooled by that. It's a very diffuse object, it's probably a degree and a half across, so all that brightness is spread over a very, very fuzzy object. But we've received some quite nice images. This is from David Swan. This is one of the first images from the UK of the comet as it rose for him up in, uh, uh, in the northeast. Uh, this is an image from John McConnell with a fairly wide field lens. You can see the TV aerial there, but there it is. So that's the kind of image you might be able to get with a very simple setup, just a kind of 135 or 200 mil lens on a, on a driven astro track or kind of simple driven mount. With bigger telescopes, people are getting some really spectacular images, so there's even tail features, uh, but these are all images taken from very, very dark sites. There is hope, though. This is an image I took last night from Chelmsford over my next-door neighbours who've put up a large diorama of an illuminated Father Christmas and baby Jesus, <laughs> which they don't turn off until about 10 p.m., which is uh, just when the comet's at its best. But you can get that in imaging. But I tried to look for it with a pair of binoculars, and it was incredibly difficult to see, even though I knew exactly where it was. So don't be fooled by pictures like this. Seeing it in binoculars would be really difficult. Uh, I just wanted to show this finally. Um, last night it was crossing the geostationary orbital arc, and so these are all the subframes that I put together to make that image. And those things trudging along the bottom here are geostationary satellites. So if you wonder where Jeremy Kyle and all that stuff comes from, it's all being beamed down by those things in geostationary orbit. Anyway, hopefully we will get some clear skies and we'll get a chance to see these things. Hopefully over Christmas you'll have a chance to go out and over the next month or so you'll have a chance to go out and, and see the Geminids, see this comet and look at the other things. Um, I showed this last year and I can't believe it's a year since I last showed it, but this is Gary Poyner's weather owl. And Gary told me that this was the most accurate predictor of weather that he knew of, much more accurate than anything else. And I did say to him uh, to do a statistical survey or something over the year, are you still confident that your weather owl is absolutely right. <laughs> it, it changes color. It changes color. If it's going to be clear, it uh, yeah. There you go. So who who needs these massive scale computing facilities to compute the weather? You use the weather owl. But hopefully you'll all have a chance to see these things. Happy Christmas, everybody. I hope you've enjoyed this meeting. I think this is an absolutely wonderful venue. Uh, thank you very much to the IOP for letting us use it. Those people who've watched on the live streaming, I hope that's worked as well. Um, and uh, I hope this, this is something that we can repeat. So happy Christmas. See you all next year. Yes, uh, thanks very much, Nick. Uh, lots of exciting things to look forward to. A nice break.